Paul Boyd was born uh, in the time that I was a pastor of uh, Dolores Mission Church, which is the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, nestled in the middle of um, uh, two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. Together, they comprise the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other during the time I was pastor there, which is kind of unheard of in public housing. Um, and so uh, I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. I buried my 229th two Saturdays ago. Um, okay, there we go. And so I, um, first thing we did was we started the school because there were so many, um, wow, that's like, I don't know what that is. It's, uh, if I hold it over here, let me put it down here, maybe it'll, it'll, so you can catch my growling stomach and, my, okay. Uh, so we started a school, so we had, um, uh, there were all these uh, junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school, nobody wanted them, so they were wreaking havoc in the projects, they were writing on the walls and violent and selling drugs. So I walked out to them and, uh, and I would kind of isolate them and say, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And then to my surprise, uh, uh, they all said, yeah, you know, I would. So uh, I, then I tried to find a school that would take them and uh, didn't find one. So that kind of forced my hand. So right across the street from uh, the church is our parochial school, our elementary school, grades uh, K to 8. And uh, the first two floors uh, belonged to uh, the school. And the entire third floor was the convent. So one night I, got, I gathered all the nuns together in the living room and I said, hey, you know, would you mind, you know, moving out? And uh, we, could, <laughs> we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. And they looked at each other and they went, sure. And that was the extent of their discernment process. And then uh, gang members came in large numbers to church property, which kind of created a disconnect people in the parish started to, uh, you know, come up to me and say, wow, uh, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out, and that was a good gospel challenge. And then uh, the homies themselves said, if only we had jobs, so myself and the women, uh, the projects are mainly made up of women and with children, hardly any men anywhere. We... Um, marched around the factories that surrounded the housing projects trying to find felony friendly employers and that wasn't so forthcoming so uh we just started things you know uh, a homeboy maintenance crew a, a landscaping crew uh, um, graffiti removal crew a crew to build our child care center all made up of rival enemy gang members from the eight gangs in uh, the, the parish then in 1992, if any were around, or um, was the unrest in Los Angeles after the Rodney King verdict. And every pocket of poverty in the city ignited except my parish. So the LA Times wanted to know why that was, so a reporter came and asked me questions. I said, well, maybe it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members maybe the most likely to uh, to torch their own community, who had a reason to get up in the morning and were working side by side by their enemies. And they had a reason not to gangbang the night before. And they had a reason more to the point of this question, um, not to ignite and torch their own community. So um, the article appeared the next day. The following day, I get a phone call from uh, a movie producer named Ray Stark who read the article. He happened to have $500 million. He summoned me to his uh, Beverly Hills office and he said, um, how should I spend my money, you know? And 
Uh, as I look back on it now, I see that I woefully undershot my request, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, um, you know, there's a, an abandoned bakery across the street from the school. It's got ovens. They don't work, but, you know, you could fix them. And you could, um, we could put hair nets on gang members and we could bake bread and I don't know. We could call it Homeboy Bakery, which was the extent of my entire business plan. And, <laughs> and he said, sure. And so we were off and running. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, uh, you know, we changed our name from Jobs for a Future to Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this. <laughs> uh, not everything worked. Homeboy Plumbing was really uh, not that hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes? You know? <laughs> I did not see that coming. And, and, uh, and now nobody, you know, you don't ever intend to do something like this, but we backed our way into becoming now, uh, we're the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet. So, I always say 15,000 folks walk through our doors because I include anybody who walks through our doors. Because everybody who walks through, even those who are there from Sydney, Australia, wanting to imagine something different, tours and stuff, they all want to imagine something different. They all want to imagine a world that currently looks different than the one where we uh, reside in, you know. They all want to. Imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle. Anybody who walks through the doors wants to dismantle the barriers that exclude. But the centerpiece is our 18-month training program. So gang members come from all over L.A. County. Who knows what the number is, you know. Uh, L.A. County, they would, um, the sheriffs who, who is in charge of counting, say 120,000 gang members, 1,100 gangs, way too high, especially on the number of gang members, but uh, they're in charge of the, uh, the counting. And so I think uh, in L.A. County, there isn't a, a, a zip code that has a gang that hasn't seen members of that gang walk through our doors. So at the time, you know, there were no exit ramps off uh, this crazy violent freeway. Um, and what did that do, the fact that gang members really couldn't get off the freeway? Well, it kept them on the freeway and it intensified uh, their despair, which increased the violence. So, um, so there's something about Homeboy, uh, you had it up on the screen there from 1992, which is when the bakery began. But the bakery kind of became this, uh, you know, symbol. And, and it galvanized the imaginations of gang members so they could see something else. Uh, so the centerpiece, as I mentioned, is our 18-month training program. Gang members come in, uh, and they want that one because it's a paid gig. Um, we, we're 31 years old now, but you know, there, for the first 15 years, so we were kind of anchored in this job-centric notion. You know, nothing stops a bullet like a job, and that was because we listened to gang members. But once we knew gang members, we kind of went, eh, "No, it's not about a job." That an employed uh, gang member may or may not go back to prison, or an educated one may or may not. But it then became our contention, and now it's our absolute guarantee that a healed gang member will not reoffend. So now we're healing centric. And so the whole point of the 18 month is a sort of a model of attachment repair. So it, it kind of uh, corresponds to the 18 months it takes for a child, an infant to connect to the caregiver. It's the same kind of thing. So everyone who walks through our doors, every gang member comes with what psychologists would call a disorganized attachment. Mom was frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. So we, we create this a community of tenderness 
a community of kinship and exquisite mutuality, where uh, gang members find something of a sanctuary from their own chronic toxic stress. And once they find rest and respite, then they become the sanctuary that they sought. And then they go home to their kids and for the first time ever, you've broken a cycle because they present that sanctuary to their kids. Uh, I think that's our, our secret sauce is the community of tenderness that, that allows them to find rest, especially from their chronic toxic stress. That's kind of the key thing like with homeless population as well is that we always want to cut to the chase. We go from zero to 60. Let's get them, you know, fast somewhere, job, home. Um, but this is so essential about the healing piece. Uh, and a lot of programs across the country just want gang members to have jobs. That, which is why I'm sort of embarrassed by the nothing stops a bullet like a job thing. Because it won't matter if you can get somebody a job fast as soon as they're out of prison, it, it, they won't keep it. There's just no question because it's always about something else. And unless you're engaged in that healing, it doesn't have, it won't last. Um, in 19th century medical history, you know, over here, they had all these vexing diseases and people were dying and they apply everything they thought to apply. Um, medicine, hospitals, doctors, nurses, nothing worked, people kept dying. And then quite inadvertently by accident over here, they stumbled upon the water supply in the sewer system and they addressed that. And what happened to the diseases? Well, they disappeared because the diseases were about something else. And that's the key with the gang thing. Now, I should tell you that in 1992, there were 1,000 gang-related homicides in LA County. That number's been cut in half and then cut in half again. And every chief of police since Bratton would credit, in a singular way, I'd say, Homeboy Industries. Um, when I go across the country, people will say, how do you get gang members to go to your place? which is a problem other programs, comparable programs have in the country. We don't have that problem. You know, we have a problem with uh, having enough money to bring as many people in, but we never have to recruit, we never have to convince or cajole. We don't do any outreach to gang members, except I'm in detention facilities as a priest where I hand out my card. I was at a, a juvenile hall and a tough kid, like 13 going on 33, he walked up to me as they, we were all shaking hands as they were walking out of the gym. And he said, how do I get your credit card? I said, I don't know, jack my wallet, I guess. I, oh, you mean this? And so I handed him my, my business card. And he looked at it on this side and he goes, hey, there's nothing on it. And I go, yeah, there it is, you know. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, so I, if there's any recruiting, I hand out my card at, at all these detention facilities. So the homies that come in the 18-month program, they go to therapy. We have uh, four paid therapists, 47 volunteer therapists, including three psychiatrists. Case management, navigation, a lot of curricular offerings, uh, all the things you would imagine. Um, you know, anger management and parenting and uh, every imaginable 12-step program. Free tattoo removal, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do. We have a designated clinic, normally nine to five, Monday through Friday, one paid physician assistant, three laser machines, 43 volunteer doctors, so if any of you are starting to regret your G3X uh, tattoo, uh, <laughs> see me, see me afterwards. And uh, and it was all started uh, because of a guy named Frank who wandered into my office and sat in front of my desk, and he had just been released uh, two days out of Corcoran State Prison, and I didn't know him, 
and tattooed on his forehead, filling the whole space like it was a damn billboard. Big black block letters that said, fuck the world. And he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. You know? <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, Frank, uh, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. So naturally, I hired him, and he bagged bread for a time. And so then I, I went looking around, trying to find a doctor with a laser machine. Found a dermatologist at um, White Memorial Hospital, a guy named Jack Fanor. And he said, okay, I'll give you one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and about a handful of others. And in no time, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same treatment, so we couldn't really stay with that arrangement. <laughs> uh, parentheses, Frank is currently a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing he's ever done proving once and for all that we're all a whole lot more than the angriest and dumbest things we've ever done. Uh, so what else do we have? Then we have our social enterprises. So we have nine of them. A homeboy Bakery, which is thriving. Homeboy Homegirl uh, merchandise where we sell our logo stuff in a store at our headquarters and online. Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food at City Hall. Uh, Homeboy Silkscreen, which has been around for, I think, 25 years. Thousands of gang members have worked through there. Um, we have a restaurant at LAX Terminal 4, American Airlines, if, uh, you know, uh, you're flying that way. Uh, farmers Markets, we have, uh, what else do we have? Uh, uh, homeboy Recycling, which is uh, electronic waste. That's quite a successful venture at the moment. What am I missing? Oh, oh we have solar panel installation training program. Uh, we have other kind of training programs connected to unions like welding. We have uh, Homeboy Grocery, where we sell chips, salsa, and guacamole, and, and uh, chains of uh, supermarkets on both coasts and homegirl cafe where women with records young ladies from rival gangs waitresses with attitude will gladly take your order <laughs> and the cater catering is a big thing um, I don't know I'm yakking too much so ask me questions and I'll I'll, I'll tell you stories yeah know your perspective or um, your approach as it pertains to when we are trying to solicit um, to some of our community business owners as far as looking for job resources and things um, what your approach was I mean I know I'm, I'm old school so I'm like let me just get in your face and give me five minutes of your time mm -hmm. but what would you suggest um, be our approach because I do find that like you said they didn't want them the plumber in the house you know what I mean like some of the some of the jobs that they can do so I've got to do a match up my skill sets with what's in the community and what um, some of these business owners are able to offer. And I just kind of want to get your additional insight and maybe possibly suggestions as to approaching them. Yeah, you know, the answer, of course, is always vicinity. If you can get people in the vicinity. Uh, in the early days, especially when it was trying to convince, uh, you know, employers to give people a chance, you know, a lot of times that was the reason I gave talks. Because I'd go to a church and maybe there was one employer, it always happened, and they were moved by stories. And they'd come up and say, I'm nervous, but send me somebody. And then you'd send them and it was always the same thing. Oh my God, this, it's not what you ever anticipated. This guy's really energetic, he's so kind. Covered in tattoos, but he's like, he really wants uh, to make this work. Can you send me more like him? Which always happened. So. Uh, that's when we had that focus. Now we have a little bit more of a uh, seal uh, of the, uh, what do you call that? Good housekeeping seal of approval. You know, it's like, oh, okay, they spent 18 months at Homeboy. So there's a, maybe if people are in the know, they kind of know that, that you're sending them somebody who's been through what we call essential fundamental healing. 
So they're resilient. They've re-identified who they are in the world. Um, they know the truth of who they are. And then we send them out, and, and this time the world will throw at them what it will, but they're not going to be toppled by it. And maybe employers know. So we have repeat, you know, even uh, repeat employers, people who've done it multiple times. It's kind of if, if in a sort of a Christian faith context where you kind of say, you know, who would Jesus hire? Well, precisely they'd hire, you know, um, Frank, you know, and other people like him. So, so you, you try to operate that way. But, we, you know, we've, we've uh, you know, we have an employment referral center. So, you know, uh, the workforce development people in our office, you know, uh, take our people. So we want that to be seamless so that they finish their 18 months with us and they move on to a better paying job and more possibilities. Yeah. But that's, you know, Mother Teresa used to say the problem in the world is that we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And that's kind of the root of just about everything. So, um, I, you know, I think Homeboy has been responsible for softening, you know, the image. So, uh, so we're 31 years old, but the first 10 years, solid, solid 10 years, death threats, bomb threats, hate mail. Never from gang members, because gang members from day one knew that Homeboy was about hope for them. But if you demonized gang members, hang on to your hat, you know. And, and often enough, the anonymous letters were from law enforcement. I'm, I'm an LAPD cop. I hate you. You are part of the problem. I mean, it was kind of startling. Never from, never ever from gang members. Once a homegirl named Lisa from the projects, a tough cookie gang member got out of probation camp. She was 10 feet from my, the door to my office and this is in our first office and a little storefront on First Street. And she answers the phone very professionally. Homeboy Industries, how may I help you? Bring that bomb over here, motherfucker. That's correct, yes, 1848 East First Street. And I'm going, whoa. Uh, uh, Lisa, what, what is that exactly? Oh, it's some fool who wants to blow the place up. I go, well, how about God bless you and have a nice day? She's giving the mad bomber map quest, you know. But it's hard to retrieve that because that was the air we breathe because the demonizing was so wholesale. And then it was, you know, the friend of our enemy is our enemy. So if, if you demonize gang members, it was really a short hop to demonize me for helping them. Yeah. But I think when people say, uh, we get discouraged and we think we're not making progress and it's not better, whoa, this, all, this haul, this work that you're engaged in is for the long haul. And so when you think about that, you know, incrementally, we are, we are nowhere where we were in uh, 1992 or 1988. You know, Daryl Gates, uh, uh, what were the, uh, Operation Hammer, I don't know if anybody even remembers those things. All demonizing things, let's uh, lock them up, throw away the key. You were talking about the Boston uh, thing. You know, it's a, it's, it's a vexing thing because, um, especially with research, you know, people will say, uh, I can remember, uh, what's his name, David Kennedy from Operation uh, Ceasefire, or maybe it's just called Ceasefire. Anyway, I was at a conference in San Francisco, I was going to speak towards the end, so I was sitting out there, he was pounding on the table, and he says, people... This works. And I remember writing in my program, yeah, but I bet it doesn't help. And I think that's kind of an essential thing about research. That, and then we need to be careful because not everything that works helps. But everything that helps works. So it's a little bit like saying uh, an oncologist says to the patient, we are going to calm and silence and get rid of this nagging cough. Could you do it? Yes. Would it work? You could. But the cough is indicating lung cancer. So unless you're actually addressing the lung cancer, it doesn't really matter whether you rid 
rid the person of the cough. However, if you address the lung cancer effectively, the cough's going to go away anyway. But that's how we are only all the time. There's a new movement now, which is called Stop the Bleeding. Uh, and there's a book out, which I just ordered. And uh, I think it was in uh, some newspaper. They had a kind of a uh, editorial kind of uh, excerpt from this book. And again, it's the same principle. It takes research. This works, this works, this works. And again, the premise is about changing behavior. And, and the premise is this. If bad thinking got us into this gang violence, then good thinking will get us out of it. Well, it's a, it's a completely preposterous analysis because bad thinking didn't get us into this. There are three profiles of a kid who joins a gang. Only three. There aren't eight. There aren't four. There are only three. One, there's the despondent kid who can't com conjure up an image uh, about what tomorrow might look like. And if you can't see tomorrow or imagine it, your present isn't compelling, and consequently you won't care whether you inflict harm or duck to get out of harm's way. It's about a lethal absence of hope. First profile of a kid who joins a gang. Second profile is the traumatized kid, the damaged kid who cannot see his way clear to transform his pain, so he keeps inflicting it, transmitting it. And the third profile of the kid who joins a gang is a mentally ill kid. So you have those three profiles, but they're on a continuum of severity. Some kids are more despondent than mentally ill. Some are more damaged than despondent, but that's it. I would bet my life that that's the analysis, not bad thinking got us into this mess. If we believe that, what would we do as a society? Easy, clear. Infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. Help heal the traumatized. Deliver mental health services in a timely and culturally appropriate way. The truth is everybody who walks through Homeboy Industries, though they're been in gangs and been in prison, they still have to address those three things on a continuum of severity. Some are still, you know, hard, have a hard time imagining what their future would look like. Or, you know, borderline personality or bipolar or may need meds. Everybody knows what the ACE study is? Yes. You know, uh, the... Uh, adverse uh, childhood experiences. And so there's a checklist, you know. I went back to it to kind of double check. I'm zero. I can't, and this is, and people kind of go, they're shocked at this, you know. Not a single thing on that list can I check off. And there are things like mentally ill parent, your father's in prison, uh, violence at home. Yeah, and so people, and so, um, What's her name, Naomi? Uh, is it Naomi? Uh, the, the, our Surgeon General. For the the first Surgeon California. General in the state of California wrote a book called The Deepest Well. Uh, it's a hyphenated name. I can't remember her name, but Harris, Burke Harris or yes. something? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So she talks about, you know, the alarm bells should be going off like at four and five. Mm -hmm. uh, Every single gang member who walks into our office is a 9 or 10. And I always say or 10, because male gang members are going to have a hard time to talk about sexual abuse if that's part of their history. But certainly 9, every single one. Any exceptions? No, there's nobody who's a 4 or a 6. They're all 9s, which is to say we're invited to stand in awe at what those folks have to carry, rather than in judgment at how they carry it. So that's what it's about. It's not about bad thinking. It doesn't mean that, you know, we always talk about, oh boy, let's try to move beyond the mind we have. But boy, is that secondary to the trauma and the despair and the mental health issues. Um, 
but you know, you hope that that kind of thing becomes part of our vocabulary. Because then you have goofball notions. Think, well, they have a choice. Whoa, 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 hold the phone. Not all choices are created equal. I did not join a gang. But that doesn't make me morally superior to all the homies who have. Trust me. The day will never come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than these folks. So I mean, ask a question, and it'll lead to a long-ass answer. So <laughs> anybody, anybody else? Yeah. Two questions. I'm just curious about your future. Where are you possibly planning on going to, which I can't even fathom after all that you've already done. And then I'm, I'm just, because I like stories, I'm curious about people in the photo with you. Uh, Okay, well, first of all, I, I, I kind of don't do future thinking. I mean, uh, we, uh, you know, we wanted the next frontier, I suppose, would be uh, residential, you know, because like 70% of our population, gang members are homeless, living in a car, couch surfing. So uh, it looks like we are going to move that way, probably have transitional housing and permanent housing. So, you know, but I don't really think in those terms so much. It's like, uh, it's kind of not how my brain works. So people walk into our headquarters and always ask me, oh my God, how'd you think this up? I go, eh, you kind of don't think stuff up. I don't, you know, you put one foot in front of the next and you respond. And uh, how about tattoo removal? Well, okay, let's, let's go, you know. Next thing you know, you have a clinic with three laser machines. But no, I never plotted it out much to the chagrin of my board. But now I have a CEO, so I don't have to do all that stuff. Uh, well, Manuela, you know, she uh, kind of runs the, uh, I don't know what she does. She kind of does the, uh, the, tours, the tours and stuff. And uh, she's very funny. Every morning in our morning meeting, she always giggles. No matter what, it's, nothing is funny, but she just, <laughs> so they call her giggles. She also answers, we get thousands of letters from uh, prisoners. And most of them are, if sometimes they're, you know, for me, which I'm terrible at it. I used to be good at it, but I'm terrible at it now. And I'll just, so I'll read them first and I'll write G if it's for me. And then mainly though, they're, I always write letter and info. So people are writing from prisons. Please send us information and or you know, I need a letter for the board saying that you'll receive me. So she does all those things. Oh my gosh, Mario, I have so many stories about him. I have my main story. Um, except it's a story that got picked up by this thing called Goldcast. Have you seen the Goldcast? Mm -hmm. 44 million people have seen this thing. I, if only we'd get each one to send us a buck, you know. How do you do that? You know. We'll yeah, please work on it. So, but I hesitate to tell that story because it's uh, a long involved one. But you can go to Goldcast. Go for it. Tell it. Oh God. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, okay. So um, it occurs to people at universities to force uh, their students to read my books against their will. <laughs> so I'm not complaining, but my uh, alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, forced their incoming freshmen to read Tattoos on the Heart. So they called me and they said, would you come and give a talk? And uh, I said, sure. It was going to be a big Tuesday night, big, huge forum with venue with a thousand people. And then they said, uh, could you bring two homies with you? And, and I always do. if People are going to pay for it. And I always pick homies in the same way I pick, normally I pick enemies, rivals, uh, f among our trainees, uh, rivals, enemies, you know, to force them to share a hotel room just to mess with them. And, <laughs> and I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the, <laughs> for the thrill of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. <laughs> Uh, some years ago, I had uh, two older Vatos. We were at LAX in uh, um, 
one of them dead serious said to me, AG, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <laughs> I said, well, yes, it's a requirement. We'll be coming home on American. So I've done this, I probably have done this a thousand times, you know, with men and women. And I've never picked anybody more terrified of flying than this guy. Oh my God, I, it was starting to freak me out. He was just petrified to the bone. In fact, he was hyperventilating, you know, <laughs> like that. And we hadn't even boarded the plane yet. So, so at Burbank Airport, if, if you've flown there, it's small. It's big bay windows, Southwest Airlines, big planes. But they don't have that hermetically sealed, whatever you call it, that chute to board. Uh, what do they call that? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yeah, but there's some kind of thing, a word for it. Anyway, they don't have that there. You have to walk out onto the tarmac like you're the president. And, <laughs> and you climb up the stairs to go to the front of the plane or the stairs to go to the back of the plane, which is the big feature at Burbank. So I'm sitting there with this guy, Mario. And uh, I had another guy, Bobby, African-American gang member who worked in the bakery. He was off walking in the, baker, in the uh, airport. And Mario was sitting next to me. So the plane a lot arrives, it's early morning, and people are deplaning. So I turn to Mario and I say, hey, that's our plane. <gasps> and I think, wow, he may actually die before we, <laughs> before we climb those stairs. So, um, and then our flight crew arrives, pilots and flight attendants, and they're, there are two female flight attendants with very large cups of Starbucks coffee, and they're schlepping up the front stairs to board the plane. And, and Mario says to me, when are we going to board the plane? I said, well, as soon as they sober up the pilots. Um, <laughs> there they go now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. So, so I should tell you, but you can see, although it's a little light, He's the most tattooed vato who works there. So uh, neck blackened with the name of his gang, all sleeved out, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, uh, eyelids that say the end, so that when he's lying in his coffin, apparently there will be no doubt for anybody. <laughs> And I'd never been in public with him. So I'm walking, I'm trying to calm him down. We're in Burbank Airport and people are like this. And <laughs> mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. And, which is interesting because if you were to go to Homeboy today, walk up to anybody there and say, quick, who is the kindest, most gentle soul who works here? They won't say me. They'll say him. They'll say Mario. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. Jean Vanier, who recently died, the founder of the L'Arche community, says that tenderness is the highest form of spiritual maturity. And Mario is proof that that's true. So we get to Gonzaga, and this is always a frustrating thing, especially with Jesuit universities, that they have the main talk Tuesday night, but they do not tell you that they have 93 other talks planned in the course of that Tuesday. Very frustrating. This class, this class, this meeting, this lunch, this class, this meeting, all damn day. And so, <laughs> so I tell uh, Bobby and Mario, look, I'm not going to speak in any of these. I'm going to sit in the back of the classroom. You get up, tell your stories. And uh, they did, they did a good job. He in particular was quite uh, petrified by the prospect of it, but stories of terror, torture, abuse, violence, nine and 10 on the ACEs study. And uh, I would not have survived a single day of their childhoods. And honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. 
So the nighttime talk came. I can't remember how this happened, if I pulled it on him as a surprise or something. I said, look, but uh, this was in the early days when I uh, didn't always do this. But I said, look, you're going to get up in front of me. And it was a huge venue, 1,000 people sitting on the floor, standing room only. Get up and do a snapshot like you had during the course of the day today and uh, tell your story so that I can have you on either side of the podium when I'm done with my thing so you can help me field questions. Oh my gosh, he was terrified. But they did a good job. So then I get up and I do my whatever, 45 minutes, and then I have them on either side of me. Yeah, question, yes ma'am. And a woman stands and she says, yeah, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out the gate. And so this tall, skinny drink of water comes up to the microphone, he clutches the microphone, and. Yes, and he's just terrified, and she says, well, you say you're a father, Mario, and you have a son and a daughter, they're about to enter their teenage years. What uh, wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? And Mario closes his eyes, and he clutches the microphone, and I can sense he's starting to tremble, and he's getting a friggin' hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell answer. <laughs> when suddenly he blurts out, I just! As soon as he says those two words, he rushes back to his microphone clutching, closed eyed refuge. And now I know he's losing the battle with his tears, but he wants to get the whole sentence out. I. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. Until the woman who asked the question stands, and now it's her turn to cry. And she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand people did what you just did. They all stood and they clapped and they wouldn't stop clapping. And all Mario could do was hold his face in his hands, overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had returned him to himself, to the truth of who he was. And everybody standing also returned to themselves exquisite mutuality. We belong to each other. And 44 million people have watched this on that stupid thing. I, if only they'd, uh, we'd be in good shape. <laughs> if, they, if they each sent 50 cents. <laughs> so anyway. I have to tell you what, once I was up in San Francisco with two homies and I, I closed this, my talk with that story. And one of the two homies, a guy named Joseph, was sobbing, just wailing. And I didn't know what it was. And then I realized that the son and the daughter who were entering their teenage years are his stepchildren. And that was his stepson, also a gang member. But he had never heard that story before. And he was just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. Anyway, neither here nor there. There you have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the first time I met your father, but I read Angel's book, and uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, you hold on injustice to me. Um, basically, summarizes uh, our Christian faith. Um, the last eight years, I am also a prison minister here in Santa Ana. And we have brought up. Um, people to your hometown in Justice and in downtown Los Angeles. It changes a lot of us in our peace and justice ministry. And really, it, I don't have the words to really express my, myself right now, but what you do is living out the faith for us as a Christian. Uh, I'm a Catholic inside of the It really 
could really um, just record the official and uh, filming the concert at home. And wow, I, I thought I will be in uh, as a prison minister for a month. Now it's been about eight years. That's the most profound ministry that I ever did in my life. And thank you for showing us that even among inmates or prisoners, there is hope. And wow. And on, on that other note, I was as a taxpayer and as a citizen of this county. What is happening uh, with our industry's philosophy versus the government? Can you imagine if hometown industries will be in, this, in all cities? Because if you, I don't know this clear steps, but our government uh, budgets or spends three times as much than a student, something like that, 87,000 people. So where is the priority of our government? And the government is you and me. So I've been writing to senators, but I am basically writing to a blank wall. Even the sheriff department in Orange County, minority believe in the conversion of the human soul. Most are still the hard, not the man, because it's a big industry. Uh, private prisoner, private prison, the concessions of food. We go to that prison in Keno, where women are incarcerated. Wow, uh, a cold sandwich is $12 because it's owned by concessionists. The political business, the inflation business is really so screwed up. Mm -hmm. And I wish. Well, so I, we just finished our. our, oh, sorry our about that. I hit no. That's okay. We just finished our three day, uh, what we call the Global Homeboy Network. So about eight years ago, we started to get uh, delegations of, from different cities. I remember the first one was Wichita, and they wanted us to airlift Homeboy into Wichita. And so I remember uh, meeting with my staff and saying, you know, do we want to become the McDonald's of gang intervention programs, you know, with over five billion gang members served, you know, and, <laughs> and so we decided not to do that. So we said, well, what if we offer technical assistance? You went, we went from a time where we actually charged, we don't anymore, but people come from all over the world. So, uh, and we had yesterday uh, finished our sixth, uh, what we call the gathering of uh, home, Global Homeboy Network. I don't know what the number is. You know, it, it's like 147 programs uh, modeled on Homeboy in this country and 16 outside the country. And so we gather what we call our partners, people, not all of them come, but we get 400 and it's packed and sold out. And it's a kind of best practices and so the idea is kind of, uh, we have a philosophy, a methodology um, that we kind of believe in. So other places across the country, you know, may, it might not, and across, around the world, it might not be gang members as such, but it's disaffected youth or that kind of thing. So, uh, but people dealing with homelessness or gang or drugs, or it's a similar kind of population. And so... Uh, yeah, this may be my last one just because I'm trying to do my 45 minutes and not overstay my welcome. Yes. Well, You're what, fine. What, yes. What role does faith play in this process of um, despondent and traumatized? And, like, what role does faith play in your programs, if any? Yeah, it doesn't play any role in terms of, uh, a, you know, a preaching proselytizing notion. Uh, you know, so the principle at Homeboy is, uh, and, and this is a battle across the country in terms of programs that are comparable, there's a, a reliance on content or context. And content is people kind of uh, embrace content as, as the be-all and end-all. And, and we have content, you know, anger management and, and um, grief and loss and 12 steps and uh, criminals and Gangs Anonymous, which is a 12-step program for gang members and criminals. 
but it's secondary to the context. And the context is the community of tenderness. So we want to live as though the truth were true. We want to put first things recognizably first. And so, uh, like, we, we're, we kind of are opposed to the language of credible messenger because it's not about message. So then it's not about messenger. Credible messenger is the notion that, you know, I'm a gang member, step aside, let me handle this. I'm going to talk, he's going to listen to me more than he's going to listen to you, which is, of course, true if the task is yakking. If the, talk is, if the task is talking, by all means, go to, go to it. But fortunate for the whole world, that's not the task. The task is listening, is receiving. I was in Houston and there was a, a young guy, former gang member, tattooed, been to prison, now working in what they call hardcore gang intervention in the streets. We don't do it, homeboy, uh, only because we don't think it's sensible, so we don't do it. If it were sensible, we'd be doing it. I did it, you know, for a lot of years in the projects with the eight gangs that lived in my parish. Shuttle diplomacy, put that Uzi down, are you sure you want to shoot that guy? I did all that. I don't regret that I did it, and I never do it again. It supplies oxygen to gangs, a bad thing. So, um, uh, so this guy comes up to me at Houston, and, uh, and he pleads with me, a very good guy who I've subsequently come to know, and he, he pleaded with me, how do you reach them, gang members? I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? which turns this whole thing on its head. And it's about the marrow of the gospel. So people settle for yakking about the gospel. And it's really cheap. But you want to be in the world who God is, compassionate, loving, kind. And that's what I hope from all the people who work at Homeboy. Um, once I had, a, we have 300 volunteers and I had a woman once come to me and she says, I have to volunteer at Homeboy Industry. I said, why do you have to volunteer? She goes, yeah, I know what this kid did. I want to know what happened to this kid. And, and that's the same kind of thing. What do I do at home? We know what's going to happen to you. It's, it's, she turned it on its head. I thought, yeah, that's exactly right. Because once you know what happened to this kid, you can actually do something. But we punish because we, we're, we're, we're unsophisticated. We punish, you know, because we think it's about behavior. Yikes, that's embarrassing. What language is the behavior speaking? If it's the language of the despondent, provide hope. If it's the language of the traumatized, help with the healing. If it's the language of the mentally ill, deliver something to them. The largest mental institution on the planet Earth is L.A. County Jail. What does that tell you? Yeah. Boy, are we not dealing with mental health issues very well. I'm a little frustrated by the mental health uh, community at the moment because they get, they, they get their chonies in a knot about this whole, you know, the people who uh, do mass shootings, like it's going to stigmatize the mentally ill. I don't get it. I spoke to a room full of psychiatrists in a ballroom at a hotel. They were incensed that I would bring up mental illness. And at that point, Dylan Roof had just killed all the folks at Mother Emanuel Church. And did, they did not want to talk about mental illness. Why? It, I think it goes without saying, but they were insistent on it. Not every mentally ill person goes on a, on a killing rampage. I think that sentence goes without saying, but there you have it. But everyone who does, is mentally ill. That's okay. What's the opposite of that fear of stigmatizing the mentally ill? Here's the opposite of that approach. Let's not talk about it. That's the opposite. And that seems essentially the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And, you know, in, in the woman of, I uh, can't remember the guy, somewhere in, uh, it was the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, killed all those people. She takes the stand when they, of course, want to give him uh, death. And she says, my son never chose mental illness. It chose him. 
Yes, of course that's right. But if it's mental illness, we can't hate him. And that's why it's untenable, because if it's mental illness, you have to have compassion. And that's untenable, and that's difficult. And, you know, Joe Biden, I know him, I love him. He came to our home growth cafe for lunch. But, you know, he says this wasn't driven by mental illness, you know, El Paso and Dayton. It's driven by hate. And I go, if hate, he says hate is not a mental illness. I go, or it's, hate is not a mental health issue. I go, I'm all ears. What would it be if it's not a mental health issue? I have no idea. Because then you're forced to say there are good people and bad people. Nonsense. Everybody has Buddha nature. Everybody has unshakable goodness. And people can't get at it. Donald Trump doesn't have access to it, I'm sorry. <laughs> he doesn't have access to it. And, and that's a cause for compassion because when people don't have access to the truth of who they are, they're strangers to themselves, and they cannot know what happiness is, and there is no pathway to joy, which is the whole point. And that's why if we stand against forgetting that we belong to each other, then we, we help. We missed so much. And when you go back to all these mass shooters, you missed it. He belongs to us. He's stockpiling assault rifles. Come on. Don't miss it. It's not about bad people doing bad things. Nobody in this room has ever met a mentally healthy racist. I'm sorry. You've never met a mentally healthy anti-Semite or mentally healthy white supremacist. And I don't think there was a single mentally healthy person carrying a tiki torch marching in Charleston, yelling, Jews won't replace us. This is about mental health. John Hinckley shoots Ronald Reagan and says it's because he's in love with Jodie Foster. And there wasn't a single person who wanted to address celebrity obsession. No, he went, he's, he's, he didn't spend a day in jail. He was in a mental institution. So I, I don't know. We don't talk about it. I get it if you say, I want to talk about mental illness because I don't want to talk about guns. I get that. We're going to chew gum and we're going to walk. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. I just feel the need to say that I am mentally ill. It's treatable. I have treatable issues. And I've been very successful. So I just wanted to put that out there that it's anybody and everybody. But see, that's the stigma. I have two nephews. One recently I buried, and uh, he took his own life hanging himself in Singapore five years earlier. His younger brother did the same. And my sister, my oldest sister, has no children now. Neither of them chose this. It chose them. And it's heartbreaking because as much as you were trying to say, here, you can deal with this. And, they, and half the folks at our place um, carry the same thing you do. But they put one foot in front of the next, they take the meds that they need, they do talk therapy, they make sure that they stay anchored in recovery, and their, their goodness shines through like yours does. But I think the alternative is not talking about it, which seems absolutely cuckoo bird to me. That's what's mentally ill. Yeah, right. but there's something in, in the Time Magazine, is, again, it's this, you know, psychiatrist saying, quit talking about mental illness. I go, what are you talking about? Because then, then you have awe about what people have to carry rather than judgment. And that's why you talk about it. Then you, feel, then you feel compassion. And then you, you watch. This guy is isolating. He's going to these websites. He's stockpiling <coughs> assault. And tenderness is going to win the day if tenderness can get to that guy. But if you think that hate is some kind of, I, I was in Chicago Midway. Somebody was wearing a t-shirt that says, love not hate. I go, really? Come on. Of course. Yeah. But my alma mater, Gonzaga, where we spoke, 
after the shooting in the synagogue uh, in Pittsburgh and a couple other things like the letter bomb guy, they start a seminar called Hate. And it's self-congratulatory, I get it, we're going to address this head on. It, you'd make more headway if you called it health instead of hate. Because what does it do when you do that? It says, I am not you. And it's otherizing. Exactly. And it's the kind of demonizing that's subtle. And I go, we won't make progress. Mm -hmm. But people like to say, we're going to address this head on, like the 19th century medical history people. We're going to address these. Yeah, but it's about something else. It's over here. Address the something else. I get frustrated with it. And it's, it's the price of our demonizing and our otherizing. And I wouldn't want us to self-congratulate when we think that we're addressing stuff head on, when in fact we're not. Yeah, last one. Um, I, Father G, we've met a couple times before, um, and I'm not going to self-congratulate you, because it doesn't suit you. Um, but this is an amazing man. Um, you came to my backyard, thanks to Charlie McPhee. We had a huge... Um, where he came to speak. Oh, that's right. And in Palos Verdes. That's right. And um, homegirls catered the day, and everybody was full to the brim with the most delicious food. Uh, I would encourage you all. What his story is, is about authenticity. <laughs> and you talk about, sorry, I'm on jet lag. So you talk about faith, it's human goodness and humanality. We're all the same. Um, and we're also different, right? We all have our, our um, challenges, we all have our joys, our sorrows. But what Father G's done is make it real. Mm -hmm. And in my eyes, you're a storyteller. And I'm very grateful for that, because anybody who's read Tattoos on the Heart, and I would encourage you all to read it, give it away to your friends, you know, get that, get, I don't, sorry, I don't care if you buy 25 copies or you just keep passing your copy from friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor. But you're laughing and crying all within the same three minutes um, because it's real. So I have a nonprofit in Rwanda. I think, okay, wait, let me back up. Your story is when you went to college and seminary, you never in a million years, I don't think, thought that you would be where you are now. And so your comment about, I don't really plan, I don't really make plans, my name is Julie. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not adding your name. Um, yes. Um, I never thought in a million years a girl who grew up in Glendale, as good as a Italian girl, would ever be able to go to Rwanda, run a school, run a school for the deaf, run a preschool, do any of the things that I do now. Um, I just never thought it would happen. I don't think you ever thought that you would be downtown LA with you know 400 homies as your, as your best friends and doing the work that you do and the pleasure that you do. I know it's not all work. But the bottom line for me is, is you've taken what God had for you mm -hmm. and you've made it real. And you've made it real for everybody. Um, you've shared and you've created a story because these are important stories to tell. We all have a story, each one of us. And I would encourage you all to step out of the box. Don't go to Rwanda, that's mine. <laughs> but, um, but you know, you make something of your story and of the story of your colleagues or your friends or the friends you don't know you have yet and lend a hand. And that's, you've just taken your big, huge, funny heart and made it real for all of us. So the fact that you're here today is really special. Thank you. And, um, I'm glad that all these folks got to got to hear you, and thank you, Zoo, for doing what you do and um, making this such a, a energetic and viable place to listen to you. So thanks for being here. Well, on that note. Thank you.